I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verses 17 through 21 is where we're going to be at this morning as we look at God's Word. You know, uh, many churches, friends of mine, things that I saw online, many churches today are, are preaching a message that's focused on uh, the election, how to deal with the election or things surrounding the election or how, what's a Christian response to the election. And, and that's not bad. But the beauty of Scripture and the beauty of teaching through Scripture, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, section by section, is that no matter where we come, this passage is relevant to us. It's relevant to us in this moment, no matter who sits in the White House, no matter who's in Congress, no matter who makes up the Supreme Court, no matter what nation we live in, no matter what gender we are, no matter what race we are, this passage is relevant to us because this is God's eternal truth that does not change with time and it does not change with seasons. It is always relevant to us as followers of Jesus Christ. This truth supersedes all nations, all leaders, all cultures. It is, it is just as relevant for a believer that is in Iran or China or Libya, as it is for believers that are here in the United States, because it is, it, is, it is eternal truth. It is not based on cultures, it's not based on leaders, it's based upon God and his character and his word to his children. And so, as we study it this morning, we are reminded of the same truth that, that believers have been reminded of for thousands of years, this truth of how we are to live our lives no matter what kind of culture we find ourselves in. And that's the truth that we see this morning, that we are to live for the glory of God as followers of Jesus. And, and Peter explains to us how we are to live for the glory of God, no matter what kind of culture we find ourselves in, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, God's word teaches us how we are to live for the glory of God. Now, if you remember, Peter is writing to followers of Jesus that are scattered throughout the Roman Empire. They've been scattered out of Rome into Asia Minor, and they are facing incredible persecution. And if we're honest and we understand, we realize that the persecution that these believers are facing is far greater than anything you and I will probably ever experience in our lives Anything that we experience, anything that we go through will probably be a fraction of what these believers were walking through. In fact, Peter himself will die under the persecution that he speaks about. He will die himself at the hand of Rome. And so his words and his teaching through the Lord have great meaning to us. And so what does the Lord say to believers that are experiencing these kind of circumstances, these kind of uh, chaotic circumstances or persecuted circumstances? What does he have to say to us? Well, we've seen so far in verses 1 through 12 that the Lord has reminded us of our identity in Christ. Peter has written to remind them of their identity in Christ and how that is the foundation of everything, that they are to look and understand that they have been given a salvation. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what's going on around them, they have a salvation given them by the Lord that will not change. And so they need to know what their identity is in Christ. And, and friends, the same is true for us. We must know our identity in Christ. It puts everything else in perspective in our lives and, and, and in verses 1 through 12, he talks to them about their identity. And then in verse 13, he begins to talk about their, their actions or their behavior or how they are to live based on that identity. And it's important that we understand that, that, we have, that, that all of the New Testament teaches doctrine and then teaches practice. Because how we live our lives must come out of what we believe and what we know and who God actually is. When we do it the other way around, when we just uh, live out of uh, something but we don't understand, we're not living out of who God is, we're trying to live maybe to please God, that becomes religion. That becomes something other than living out of the grace that God has given us. But when we understand who we are in Christ, when we understand the salvation that we've been given the fruit of our lives then comes out of 
that reality and that truth. And so in verses 1 through 12, he lays out this doctrine to us. Then in chapter, in, in verses, sorry, in, in verses 1 through 12, in verses 13 to 16, Peter makes a, a, a change and he begins to talk about how we are now to live our lives as followers of Jesus. And he says that we are called to live in three distinct ways. We saw two of them last week. The, those are that we are to live as uh, those that are marked by hope, and those that are marked by holiness. As followers of Jesus, the world should know us because we are marked by a hope in Christ that is different than the hope of the world. And we should be marked by a holiness that is, it is, uh, that is given to us by the Lord. That is, as followers of Jesus, we are marked by this holiness. And if you missed that message, I encourage you to go back. Neil did a great job talking to us about hope and holiness that we see in verses 13 to 16. But now in verses 17 through 21, he gives us this third characteristic of what should mark our lives as followers of Jesus, and that is that our lives should be marked by the fear of the Lord. Our lives should be marked by the fear of the Lord. Let's look at it together. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. He says, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially, According to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and that your hope are in God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this eternal truth that withstands the test of time. Father, we pray, God, that as we are reminded, Lord, of what our lives should look like, Lord, that you would give us a new sense and a new understanding of what it means to live our lives for an audience of one, what it means to live in a right fear of the Lord, God, that you are our greatest desire, that you are our greatest hope, that you are our greatest joy. And so, Lord, would you teach us now from your word? Would you correct us in the areas of our lives where we've allowed other things to creep in and take first priority in our lives? And so, Lord, that we might be a light that you've called us to be and to walk by the hope and the faith that you've led us in. And we love you. And so lead us now in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there is one main idea, and then there are three reasons that Peter gives for this idea. We see the main idea in verse 17. It, it, we'll come back to the beginning of it, but we'll read it now. If you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, and here's the main idea, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. The main idea that Peter has that he is communicating in these verses is that you and I should live our lives in the fear of the Lord. And so the question then has to be, well, what is the fear of the Lord? Many misconceptions of the idea of the fear of the Lord. Some people think that, does that mean we, we run around thinking that God's going to squish us like a, a bug or something? That, that's a wrong idea of the fear of the Lord. So, so what is the fear of the Lord in Scripture? What do we see? Well, the idea of the fear of the Lord is the idea of reverence, of awe, of respect, of regard. These are all English words that communicate this idea of, of, of what it means to fear the Lord. The, the best way to say it would be reverent awe, that we are in reverent awe of the Lord, that we put him as first and, and, and preeminent in all things. Let me give you maybe an example. As you, as you go and you stand, maybe you've been to the Grand Canyon. As you go to the Grand Canyon and you stand there on the edge and you don't want to get too close <laughs> because you're, you, you know, if you get too close, that, that could be disastrous. And as you stand and you look at this massive canyon, you don't stop and say, I'm pretty impressive, right? 
I'm a pretty good guy. I'm, I'm, I've done a lot. I'm, I'm a pretty impressive guy, right? That is not what you say. You are in awe of this creation, and hopefully it even leads you to awe of the creator, right? That you are in awe, that at that moment you realize how small you are. You realize how fragile you are. You realize that, 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 that you just, if you fell off this cliff right now, you are gone, Right? And so you stand in awe, and, and, and that's a, a picture there of, of what this idea is. Now, the opposite of that, the opposite of the fear of the Lord would be disregard. It would be disrespect. It would be rebellion. It would be like walking up to the edge of the Grand Canyon and just jumping off, right? Thinking, oh, it doesn't really matter. Not realizing the consequences of that decision. It's a disregard for the majesty of what you are encountering. And, and we see the reality of that in, in, in the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. We see that they had a, a disregard for the fear of the Lord. The Lord commanded them, obey my commands and, and have a fear of the Lord. We'll see that in Deuteronomy but instead, what happens, they begin to worship false gods. They begin to worship false idols. They begin to disregard God and turn to the other nations. And God brings judgment upon them because they do not have a right sense of the fear of the Lord. And they need to be corrected. The Bible teaches this idea of the fear of the Lord in multiple places. One of the first places is in the book of Deuteronomy. As God gives his law, and then he tells the people to obey his law, this is what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, this is Moses talking, by by walking in his ways and by fearing him. Part of the way that we walk in obedience is by having a right fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9 verse 10 tells us this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And throughout the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, this idea of the fear of the Lord is central to a right standing with God, to a right relationship with God that we would properly understand who God is and who we are and we would respond in accordance with that. So living in the fear of the Lord is living with God as the most important thing in your life. If you're a note taker, that's probably a great note to take. Living in fear of the Lord is living with God as the most important thing in your life. What God says, what God loves, what he desires, that all of these things would be the most important, that they would be the most preeminent in our hearts and minds. Now the opposite of that, if we don't have the fear of the Lord, the opposite of that would be the fear of man. Caring what man thinks, what man says, what man believes, what our culture would communicate to us, or even what our own hearts would communicate to us. This is all aspects of the fear of man, that we would live according to that rather than living according to the fear of the Lord. And you will either have the fear, you will either live in the fear of God in a right way, or you will live by the fear of man. And you can know which it is that you live by, by what are you more focused on pleasing? Are you more focused on pleasing men, mankind, even your own heart? Or are you more focused on pleasing the Lord God, the creator who made you, who redeemed you, and who saved you? Peter is saying a right way that we would walk as Christians is to have a reverent fear of the Lord. Then he says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. He reminds them again, this word exile, that they are strangers that they are temporary residents, that, that they're just camping, right? They're just setting up their tent, they're living, they're trying to be obedient to the Lord, but one day they are going to go home. And that this moment in time is just a moment. And we need to be reminded of that, especially when we face major situations where there are major changes in our country. We need to be reminded that this is not our eternal home, 
that we are citizens of a greater kingdom. Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what believers have understood for thousands of years, that our true citizenship is in the kingdom of God. It's with God. And so whatever, whatever country we live in, whatever citizenship we are under, we, we live as good citizens, right? We'll see that in 1 Peter. He says, honor the emperor, live as good citizens, but realize and recognize that your ultimate citizenship is not in this temp- temporal world. It's not in this temporal place. It is in the eternal kingdom of God. And God is going to recreate this earth into something that he designed from the beginning, good and perfect, and we are going to be with God forever. That is our eternal home. And there will be no White House in that home. There will be no, you know, there will be no nations or governments. There will just be the Lord God Almighty ruling over all. And so we must be patient. We must wait in faithfulness and in hope. And we must point people to the hope of a better nation, the kingdom of God. And so, so, so then Peter says, so then how should we live as citizens of God's kingdom? What should mark us? And he says we should be marked by the fear of the Lord. And now we can see in this passage, he gives us three reasons why we should live in the fear of the Lord. And the first reason is found in verse 17, and that is that the Lord is our righteous judge. The Lord is our righteous judge. Look at verse 17. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now, this is a conditional statement in the Greek. It says, if you call on him, but some translations you might have actually translate it since you call on him, because in the Greek, there's different ways to have these conditional phrases, and and a first-class conditional phrase, which is what this is, it makes a statement of fact. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not an if and then as if it doesn't happen, but it's an if and then as in this is a statement of fact. So since you call on him as father, right, if you do what? If you call on him as a father who judges impartially. Now Peter uses two words here, and both are important. He says he is a father who judges. Now when you think of father, hopefully... You think of love, you think of relationship, you think of being a, a son or daughter, you think of family, and so it's a, it's a picture that, that you have of that, and then you see this word judge, and it makes you think of judgment, and giving an account, and maybe God's wrath, and, and, and in our culture, we've kind of separated these two ideas. In fact, the Christian community kind of goes in pendulum swings, And it seems like some people have swung all the way over to God's grace and love and forgiveness. And that's the only place they live. They they, they would only see God as Father. And so then it doesn't really matter how they live. They can live however they want because God is this forgiving God that will forgive everything. And God wants the best for them. So then they can disobey his word because because their hearts are happy, right? Right? That's what, that you, if you haven't heard that, many people say that. God wants me to be happy. God wants me to be happy in my marriage. God wants me to be happy in my life. God wants me to be happy in this. And so they think that, that, that God is so loving and so forgiving that, that he wants us to live any way we want. But Peter reminds us that God is not only our father, but he is also a righteous judge. And he doesn't put these in in opposition together. He puts these in connection with each other. That we should see God as both a loving father and a righteous judge. That these are not in opposition. That these are the character of God. And I think uh, at times we can swing over too far to the fact that believing that God is just out to judge us and to condemn us and, and all those kinds of things. But the reality is, if we're honest, most of our Christian culture has swung too far over to one side that we live in this kind of uh, anti-law type of situation where we believe we can do whatever we want, live however we want, act however we want. And if anyone says, do this, we think it's legalism. 
People put legalism on everything. They just throw the word legalism. It's like a Christian phrase. If somebody says, you know, we're supposed to live this way, people go, oh, that's legalism, <laughs> right? If you tell me to do anything, it's legalism. That's not legalism. That is righteousness that God has called us to walk in and to walk in his righteousness, that God is our righteous judge. And Peter sees him in this way. That God is our righteous judge. Now, he says that he judges impartially. That means that God judges all people the same, righteously. It does not matter uh, who you are. It does not matter what gender, what race, what nation, what financial status you have. All men and women will be judged by the same standard. And that standard is God's perfect righteousness and holiness. He is a righteous judge. And friends, all of us, all of us have violated God's law. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The reality is that all of us will stand before God one day and his righteousness will be the indicator of his judgment. And with, with, without any other help, we all would be righteously condemned by God's wrath and his justice. And yet the beauty of the gospel is that God in his grace made a way that we would not have to face the wrath of the Father. That Jesus would come and that he would, he would live a perfect righteous life in our place, a righteousness that we could not live. He would live for us. And then he would willingly go to the cross and he would suffer and he would die and he would bear the wrath of sin upon himself. He would become sin for us that when God looked upon us, when God judged righteously, he would be able to judge righteously and to judge our sin. But Jesus would stand in our place. And that's what Peter is going to say in a moment, that not only is the Lord our judge, but the Lord is our salvation but just because the Lord is our salvation does not mean that he is not a righteous judge. And we must realize and understand that even though we are recipients of God's grace, we still live for the glory of God. We do not live for the glory of ourselves. And if we live for the glory of ourselves, it means that we do not fully understand the grace that we have received in Jesus Christ. If a Christian says, well, I'm saved and so I can live any way I want, that is evidence that they do not understand the grace that has been poured out through Jesus Christ. It does not change the reality that God is our righteous judge. We will give an account. The Bible tells us we'll give an account for everything. The Bible tells us that we, we live our lives for the glory of the Lord. And so, therefore, we live in the, in the right, reverent fear of the Lord. We live our lives for an audience of one. Well, the next thing that Peter says here, the second reason that we should live our lives in the fear of the Lord is because the Lord is our salvation. The Lord is our salvation. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Notice how he connects here. He says, conduct yourselves with fear, knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways. He connects these two ideas, and he says, the reason that you should live in the right fear of the Lord is because you have been saved. You were ransomed. This word ransomed, it is technical language for a slave who was purchased back. Uh, in ancient times, there would be, you know, war would happen, and then there would be slaves that would be taken from that war. And sometimes they would be sold back to the country of which they were taken from. That king could buy them back. And this idea of ransom is this idea of this slave being purchased back to the country to which they came from. And, and, and we see multiple times in Scripture that the, uh, this picture of being ransomed or being purchased is used of us, that we were purchased by the blood of Christ. Notice in 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul says this, For you were bought with a price. 
So glorify God in your bodies. Paul says, your bodies do not belong to you. You were bought with a price. You have been ransomed. Therefore, live in that way. Here, Peter says, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. The word feudal means useless. It means worthless. And we can see that the, the philosophies of the world that are, are taught through media, that are handed down sometimes from families that, that do not know the Lord. Uh, we see it uh, handed down from the education system. All of these world philosophies, right, that, that it's all about you. Uh, you can be anything you want to be and that you should live for your own pleasure and that, you know, you, you should live for, for yourself. You know, be all you can be, right? That, these ideas are vain philosophies that that remove a person from the way that they were actually created, which is to worship the Lord God Almighty, they confuse everything. And so Peter says, look, you were taught uh, uh, vain, perishable, uh, sorry, you were taught feudal, feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Right? The, the Israelites, they were ransomed out of Egypt. And what happened? They kept wanting to go back to Egypt. Right, they were ransomed out of Egypt and they were sitting in the desert and they're going, man, we sure had it nice in Egypt. And you're like, really? You were, you were a slave being beaten? You, you think you had it nice in Egypt? And yet that's how our, our mind thinks. We think these feudal things are where life is found. And, and Peter says here that the right fear of the Lord will remind us that where our true life, our true hope is found is in Christ so how were you ransomed, he says, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. I love this because is that what you think of when you think of perishable things? Do you think of silver and gold, right? I mean, my, uh, my gold ring, I think it's the only gold I own. My gold ring, right, is going to outlast me. It's, it's just this reality. It's going to outlast me. Gold lasts longer than us. It is more valuable in this world, right? It is the most valuable thing in this world. And yet Peter throws it under the bus in reality and says, listen, what you value as the most important thing is just perishable. It's just going to be gone, and friends, I think I, we need to stop for a moment and just, just ask the question, are, is your life in the pursuit of just perishable things? Are you so focused in life of pursuing money and power and position and, 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 and comfort and all the things maybe that this world has to offer that you're going to miss out on the things of eternal weight and eternal value that God calls us to, these spiritual realities? We need to be careful that we are not chasing perishable things. He says here that they are perishable things such as silver or gold, but you, you were bought, you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. Look at the comparison here. Per perishable things like gold and silver, and now he says, but the most valuable, the most eternal, the most everlasting thing is the precious blood of Christ. Do you realize the price that was paid for your salvation? The blood of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The idea of a lamb represents innocence. The idea of without blemish or spot represents perfection, that Jesus was this perfect lamb. This, in, this He was perfectly innocent, meaning he had never sinned. He had never committed injustice against God. He died in our place. And if you look at the Old Testament, you see this, this repetitive picture of lamb after lamb after lamb after lamb being slaughtered. And then you come to the book of John, and you see John the Baptist say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then throughout that gospel account, you realize that how Jesus is going to do that is he is going to suffer and die and shed his blood for the purchasing back of his own people. This is the picture that Peter is pointing out and he's saying the reason that we should live in fear of the Lord is because we have been ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus. And so why else would we ever put anything higher than our Lord and Savior? 
And it was not by accident, but it was through God's perfect design. Verse 20 says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Peter says he was foreknown. This is the same word that's used of the elect exiles in verse 2. The idea that God, by his sovereign grace, has elected not only the means of salvation, but those that would receive that salvation. They have been redeemed, not because of their work, not because of who they are, but by God's grace alone. This does not remove our responsibility. This does not remove uh, our need to respond. But it tells us the reality that our response is solely because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that he has been made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Friends, what privilege that we have been given. That we live after the cross. That we have heard the gospel message And by God's grace, hopefully, have received and responded to the gospel message. You have been privileged beyond imagination. You have been ransomed. And so have you taken advantage of that opportunity? I I need to ask you this morning, have you trusted in Christ? God is offering you salvation, but you must receive it. You must respond in faith. If you want to talk more about what that means, I would love to talk to you afterwards about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter says that, that we have been saved, we, that it has been made manifest, who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Who through him, through Christ, are believers in God. God has granted us faith And then he tells us which God, so that there's no mistake, the God who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory. This glory that Jesus has been given, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And so why do we live in fear of the Lord? Why do we live in the right fear of the Lord? We live in the right fear of the Lord because Jesus is king and he has saved us. And we have the opportunity to glorify him with our lives. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 tells us this. And Jesus being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, that's why we live in reverent fear of the Lord. Because we have been redeemed. Because we have been ransomed. Because he loved us so much that he gave his son so that we could be purchased back from the wrath that we deserved. Because the Lord is our salvation. Peter concludes this section with one more way, one more reason why we should live in reverent fear of the Lord. And he he ends this section in the same way that he began in verse 13, if you remember, and it's on remembering our hope in the Lord. So the third reason is that the Lord is our hope. The third reason that we should live in the fear of the Lord is because the Lord is our hope. Peter ends it by saying, so that your faith and hope are in God. So that communicates a purpose. It communicates a result. The result of our salvation should be the fear of the Lord, which is reflected in our hope and our faith being in God alone. Your faith, my faith, our hope is not in this world. It is to be in Christ And when it is in Christ, we will live in a right, reverent fear of the Lord, knowing that God is sovereign, knowing that God is in control, knowing that God will lead us day by day by his word and by his spirit, knowing that our hope is not in material things of this world, but in the spiritual, everlasting things of God, knowing that our hope is not in temporary things like governments that will come and go, but in eternal things, knowing that They are not in the things of this world. Our hope is not in the things of this world, but it is in the things of the kingdom of God. 
Friends, is that where your hope is found today? Is that what you're resting in? Is that where, if, if your hope is in God's kingdom, then your hope can never be shaken. Because God is still on his throne. He is still king of kings and lord of lords. And nobody casts a vote for him. He is just the sovereign king. He rules and he reigns. And he removes leaders and he adds leaders and he moves in nations and he destroys nations and he raises up nations and he sovereignly rules over the universe. And if that's where your hope is, then you can rest in him regardless of anything else that is going on around you. Your hope can never be shaken. And if your hope is not shaken, if your faith is not shaken, then you can rightly lead your life in the fear of the Lord. Not in the fear of man, but in the reverent fear of the Lord. I pray that's where your heart is this morning. I pray that you're walking in reverent fear of the Lord, that you're living for an audience of one, that he is your greatest desire and your greatest joy, and your focus is on pleasing him with your lives. Paul, uh, Paul says it this way in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. It's a great verse for us to be reminded of and to memorize if we can. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Friends, let your lives be marked by hope. Let your lives be marked by holiness. And let our lives be marked by the fear of of the Lord. That's how we become the aroma of Christ to the world. Not that we look like them, but that we look so different because our hope is different. Our holiness is different. And as we walk in the fear of the Lord, they see what is, what is the most, uh, most important thing in our lives is not the fear of man, but the fear of God. That's how we live for the glory of God in all things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, God, that, that you put everything in perspective through your word for us. We pray that your Holy Spirit this morning, God, would, uh, would just bring comfort and peace where we need it, Lord. God, we pray that we would be reminded, Lord, that, that you are the sovereign king of kings, that you are the ruler of the nations. And Father, that our hope is, is not in this world, it's not in kingdoms, but it's in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us this week even, God, that we would live in a right fear of the Lord, that we would do all, of, all the things in our lives, that everything that we do, Lord, would be to live for an audience of one, that we would, by the, at the end of our lives, that we would be able to hear from our Lord and Savior, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. Lord, may you help us to be able to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to move now into a time of response. And the first way that we're going to respond as a church family is that we're going to respond by going to the Lord's table and taking communion together. Now, if you're new here at Grace, let me just explain what we're doing. As we come to the Lord's table, we are, first of all, we are proclaiming that we are followers of Christ and that we are followers of Christ as a body. As we, as we take these elements, we are saying that our hope, that our salvation is not in what we have done, but it's in what Christ has done for us. And so if you're here this morning, you're, you're joining us, and you would not identify yourself as a Christian. You would say you have not placed your faith or your hope in Jesus Christ. First of all, I want you to know we're so thankful that you're here. I hope that you'll come back again. I hope you'll ask any questions that you might have about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and why do we do the things we do? Some of it might seem strange to you. We would love to help you understand why we believe through God's word and why we do what we do. But we would ask that this part of our service, that if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian, that this morning you would just observe. And what you're gonna be observing is people that are proclaiming their faith and their hope in Jesus Christ. There's no shame in staying seated. There's actually integrity and honesty, and we absolutely respect that. 
The, the Bible says that we must be followers of Jesus to take communion. But the other thing that is true is, is that we must be in a right relationship with the Lord. And so we want to give you time to, to spend time with the Lord, to confess sin in your life, and, and to make sure that you're in a right spot with the Lord. In fact, the, the Bible says that if we, if we uh, take communion in an unworthy manner, we only bring judgment upon ourselves. As we look through Scripture, we, we see what that means is if we are proclaiming that we're Christians, but we're walking in outright rebellious sin against God, if you're going to leave this room and go right back out and live as though God doesn't exist, the Bible says you should be careful about what you do in proclaiming to be a follower of Jesus. And so we need each person to examine their hearts. You're not, not to be perfect. None of us are perfect. But to be in a right relationship with the Lord. And so take this time. Spend it with the Lord. Confess sin. Thank Him for what He's done in the gospel. And then together as one church, we will take remembering what Christ Jesus has done. So take the elements and bring them back to your seat. And then we'll take all together remembering what Christ has done. As we think about Jesus being, or we think about God being our righteous judge, it should give us pause for a moment, be reminded of what we deserve. I know what I deserve. I, I know what my heart's like. I know what my rebellion is against God. I know that I deserved God's wrath and and yet what we hold in our hands is a reminder of God's incredible mercy. That while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. That while we were enemies of God, God reconciled us and made us his own children. And so we are to remember as Jesus has called us to. And to give thanks. The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body, which is for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Take and remember your sins are forgiven. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said to them, this cup is a new covenant which has been given in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Take and remember the mercy that God showed you in Christ Jesus. Father, as we, as we take that cup, we are reminded, Lord, of the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood so that we might be saved, so that we might be ransomed back from slavery. And Father, we're reminded that he, Jesus, drank the, the cup of wrath that, that was for us, that, that we deserved, and And yet Jesus drank that in our place and for our sin. But Lord, we're also reminded, God, of the great banquet that awaits, that Jesus has been resurrected, that he goes before us, and that he waits to lovingly call his bride home. And and Father, we pray that in this moment of the already but not yet, God, that, that we are living in this temporal moment, Lord, that you would put our eyes back on Jesus, the author and founder of our faith, Lord, and, and Lord, that we would, we would walk in obedience to him. God, that he would be our greatest joy and our greatest hope and our greatest desire. And so, Lord, where we have failed at that, forgive us. Lord, would you give us strength that we would be light, that we would be salt, that we would walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you've called us. God, we thank you for the reminder of your word this morning. We pray that you would strengthen us so that we could obey it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.